Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic podcast. Today's guest doctor is a person that I became acquainted a while ago. He's uh, one of the Australian jazz heroes uh, and I'm explaining you why I'm telling you this. Uh, his name is associated with the Australian Jazz Real Book. So he started uh, this uh, thing, this project a while ago. Maybe Tim can explain to us a bit better than what I can do. But he put together a collection of some fantastic Australian jazz tunes that are ready to go, means that you can take it to your gigs and play, trying to, um, you know, diffuse the Australian jazz a bit more into the world. So I'm very honored and pleased to uh, present you the guest doctor of today, Tim Nikolsky. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Great to be here. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. That's very kind. Uh, that's what you deserve for your work. <laughs> um, so can you just tell us a little bit about this project? Because I, I know it, it's, it was the theme of your uh, PhD. So you are actually a doctor. So I didn't I, exaggerate or anything like that. <laughs> uh, look, I am. It's, um, look, the Australian Jazz Real Book uh, was really born out of uh, actually doing gigs. Um, um, and... Yeah, I look to, to tell you the story briefly. You know, I was doing all these gigs at um, uh, these kind of roving kind of gigs over the summer um, at uh, the Australian Open Tennis. They were all sort of outside gigs, and there'd be you know the Grand Prix kind of things as as well. And there was this kind of circle of musicians that um, played these sorts of gigs, and there would be no rehearsal or anything. And you know, you you would. You would turn up and your currency as a musician really is how many tunes do you know i mean we weren't reading from music because that you know there was you would have to bring a music stand so what what is the currency of the tunes that you know and so i uh, you know you would your currency would be to rock up and do these gigs and um uh, unrehearsed and make music happen with someone that you potentially have never worked with before um, and so that is, uh, you know, that is the life of, of, of a musician, of a working musician. And what, what I found was that there were these tunes that were being sort of passed around in these circles and we had a lot of fun playing them and, you know, they were as good as anything that you would hear anywhere around the world or encounter in any particular real book. And I started to think, well, why... Why is there no, you know, Australian, you know, version of this? How come these tunes are not more widely known outside of uh, the circle that they are being played in? And so I started to sort of collect these tunes and document them, and suddenly they started to grow a little bit. And then uh, I think someone provoked me with an idea that. Um, you know, this needs to be sort of a wider thing and potentially part of a study. So, you know, I wrote a whole lot of, I wrote many, many, many years of unsuccessful grant applications uh, to try and get a, um, a, a real book together. And then someone said, oh, well, you know, could be a, um, like a master's in this. And the master's quickly turned into a PhD. And it was a PhD by project. And um, I had a really fantastic uh, supervisor uh in in david forest uh and you know it was well supported to do this and um and it was it was actually really fantastic to do because there was that sense that uh it was it was needed 
you know, uh, apart from, you know, sort of Australian cultural history, it's, it's kind of turned into a reasonably sort of significant resource in that, you know, the physical book exists and there's, you know, yeah. 416 tunes wow. uh, or thereabouts. But, you know, I, I've since the PhD is completed, um, I've effectively turned it into a digital curation space, which allows it to be constantly expanded and updated and to have new features uh, put out every month. Um, and that's actually really fantastic because there is, uh, of course, you know, the Australian creative music scene is incredibly diverse and incredibly vibrant. Yes, and people, I agree. people keep making all this extraordinary music that deserves a platform and more people to know about it. And so I think there's nearly 1,600 tunes um, uh, on the um, uh, that are digitally curated on the website. And so I think we're... It, it's it's turning out to be a reasonable body of work, you know. Um, That's great. That's great. I'm also uh, fascinated by your own description of the work that you have uh, create a lot of uh, accolades, but also some enemies in doing that. <laughs> I, I don't want you to, to go down there, but I, I can imagine that sometimes, you know, when you do something like that, it's very easy to, because it's the nature of it, you can't include mm. everybody, or at least you can't do it in one go, right? It's, it's a long process, and there is a lot of work behind, you know, publishing four, five, ten tunes. Uh, I know that. <laughs> you, you know this, yeah, you I know, absolutely I know, know the politics involved. But I remember that uh, a similar project, not as well constructed and conceived as yours, happened in Italy about 15, 20 years ago. I, will, I was still there at the time. And I think maybe for the nature of Italians, I think it created more enemies than friends, you know, even yeah. because it, it was probably a smaller uh, edition and... Uh, and probably the digital wasn't, you know, at mm. that time wasn't big enough to justify uh, some work. And uh, but anyway, this is uh, look. It's, look, I can I can certainly I, I can certainly understand how it would create uh, you know more friction um, than than glue um, for the scene. You know, it's it's an extremely political um, thing to do, um, and the decision making process about what you include and what you exclude is uh, is fraught with danger. You know, yeah. Um, you know, fully recognise that, and I guess the you know the the topic of the PhD in an academic sense was how you actually go about putting together something like this. So I used a whole lot of different methodologies yeah. and. There was a whole lot of people that um, informed its creation and I sought feedback from the widest range of people that I could. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that it's perfect. I'm not saying it is as diverse and as inclusive um, as it needs to be. And and to be, to be fair, I think um, uh, the criticism that I have uh, in what I've learned since doing that um, you know, uh, I think I think the scene has really, really changed, um, and people are much more aware of uh, what what diversity and inclusion looks like in that time. Yeah. So you know, if I was to do it again, for instance, it would I think it would be quite different. Um, and you know, certainly if I was to embark on doing a volume two or three or otherwise, uh, I think. Uh, it would look quite different, but you know the the aims and the values of it, um, particularly in the digital curation space, have always been about diversity and inclusion. Because there is, like, it's online. There is unlimited amounts of space. Yeah. You're only restricted by how much you can put on the server, really. Yeah. So that that has really allowed me to be um, far more inclusive um, and have a range of really established um, players that have had 
you know, uh, many albums released under their name, yeah. but also, you know, giving representation for, um, for people that are maybe not perhaps just starting out, but, you know, maybe it's their debut release or maybe it's a new band or maybe it's uh, something a, a little bit different. So, And I think it's important because, uh, you know, for the young people or young students, uh, we look very old. You know, I have all those obscure things at my back. You have some more obscure things yeah, yeah. at your back. That, of course, we know very well what they do. But uh, for the young students, it can be uh, a little bit strange to look at it because they act differently and they source their resources uh, in a different way. So it's mm. important to be digitally present, but it's also important to show to them that, for example, there are still some things that we can't pass on. Like, I know that everyone today is using iReal Pro, even I, you know, sometimes when I teach, if I want to practice something specific, but what I don't like about iReal Pro, and I still go back to the physical copy of my first real book, is that I need a melody, you know, if I want mm. to uh, learn something. So the fact that you have also, in, in both the digital and the physical copy, you include everything, and the brief description of the music and the composer, I think it has a great, great value. Uh, for the people, especially in this country that I happen to know a bit more since I moved here, but mm. uh, there is that sense of abandonment that you know pervade in, in the scene that we feel we all feel that we are so far away, even though with internet you can reach everyone, but we know that the reality is different. And I mean, if you want to organize a, even a short tour in Europe or America, it's almost impossible, you know. Mm. Oh, look, absolutely. Look, it's, uh, I guess it's a, it's a two-edged sword on that. I mean, we, um, uh, look, look, I completely understand, you know, there is very little awareness of uh, Australian creative practice overseas. Um, and a, a, I guess there is a, there's a criticism to be made that, um, uh, Australia is not particularly good at celebrating and recognizing um, its, you know, creative industries and its its. Um, but uh, this its is creative I think, people. I think you know. this is for every country because I remember in Italy we complain about the same thing. We welcome every American that blows into a horn, mm. uh, but we don't recognize our great, you know, players. I think it's embedded in in the fact that you live here you live in a country and you don't think that the place where you live is the best place mm. and it has much to offer i think it's in the human nature to think like that it's it, it's interesting but the thing that i've sort of uh i guess thought about and tried to consider though um certainly in developing australian jazz real book but also you know since then about documenting and listening to the creative practice of a really diverse range of people is that in Australia, we're actually quite free to um, make cultural improvisations to solutions that we encounter. And we're not particularly unencumbered by tradition. By tradition. We, you know, we don't feel that weight of the parameters surrounding our creative practice. And so there are unique things that are developed um, here in Australia precisely because of that, because nobody told us, you know, that we shouldn't do that or that it's not um, culturally appropriate or, you know, you're not meant to do it that way. There's, there's, uh, I think one of the really fantastic things about Australia's, you know, creative music scene is that we have all those things um, that are unique and that can only exist in Australia. Um, because of various factors that, you know, come together to influence that. And I think documenting that, I think that is really particularly exciting and yes. interesting. I do agree. Uh, Tim, it's, it's very pleasurable to talk to you about that. Um... Oh, and to you too, as always. We always have great conversations. <laughs> 
But Fantastic. Uh, I need to remind my boss uh, <laughs> that this podcast is about transcribing. So uh, I'm going to shoot you the first question and then sure. we might come back, you know, come um, to, to the Australian Jazz Real Book because I think it has a relation to the art of transcribing. But anyway, uh, the first question is, do you transcribe? And if you do so, why do you do it? Well, this is, yeah, I, I, I transcribe. Um, for me, uh, transcription, um, I guess the definition or uh, how I engage in transcription might be a little bit different than the traditional jazz uh, practice and values of, of transcription. Um, but for me, you know, it is a pathway to become closer to the genius. And that's, I guess that might be a thread that, you know, regularly comes through your podcast as well, is that through that act of deep listening <coughs> and deep analysis, there, it is, it is a pathway to try and understand and be closer to, you know, the genius that has existed, whether it be a recording or, or whatever kind of artifact. So, um, but I guess, you know, uh, it's interesting to mention, you know, when you talk about our real book that you need to go back to the actual, the, the physical tangible uh, real book to get the melody. Um, and that act of tangibility of something existing on something physical is, is an important thing. Um, but I, I guess my idea of uh, transcription sort of goes beyond, you know, um, you know, chord scale theory and, you know, uh, accurately representing, you know, um, solos and, and um, you know, in, insight into improvisation. Of course, that is an extraordinary thing to involve yourself as well. And that's a, it is a lifelong pursuit. Um, however, when I'm listening to music, and trying to understand, you know, the brilliance or genius that has gone on within or this try to understand the special unique thing that makes that particular recording, you know, interesting, individual, unique, all those sorts of things. Um, I'm listening to far more diverse things than just note selection and harmonic selection, even though those things really spin my wheels. You know, I'm, I'm listening to how things were recorded. I'm listening to lots of production decisions. I'm listening to the reverb tales. I'm listening to the, uh, the room in which that it was recorded. I'm, I'm seeking to hear, you know, the, the fingers interacting with the strings. Uh, was it fingers? Is it nail? Is it some kind of combination of both? Um, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to place myself in the room in which it was recorded. Now, the really fantastic thing about, um, about jazz recording over the ages, it, it seems that every decade um, has different um, technological values that have been you know, implied or imposed within documenting uh, the genre and documenting the recording. And so there are really great things to listen to in each era of jazz as, and I guess that has really kind of evolved um, through technological advancement and these sorts of things. But I actually really love that because that provides a, I guess an oral um, uh, mind map um, and context building um, that, that, you know, makes sense to me. Like I, I like to hear Rudy Van Gilder's room, you know, <laughs> and, you know, at, at, you know, in Hackensack, New Jersey, you know, I, you can hear, you know, his, his parents living room and you can hear that piano and, you know, how it sounds in that way. And of course, you know, aided with the, um, the brilliant blue note photography, those the iconic, you know, black and white images as well. I mean, yeah. that just really adds to that, a visual association and that um, that imagination of the presence of being close to the music being made in that room. Yeah. No, I I'm so glad you you gave us this uh, response, which is a bit different from 
some other responses. So th this is the usual first question to all my guests. And I have received a very broad uh, array of, of different responses. Uh, but this is very interesting, even because as we were, as I was saying before, and I hope you don't get offended, uh, of you know, course. for some people we look very old, you know, and still attached to some values that we think are very precious. And uh, this is why I usually don't like the all the digital platforms that deliberately omit a lot of information that are so important to me, but it's so important for everyone to understand what's behind, you know, a, cre so right. a creativity. So I was doing a bit the same when I was buying all the CDs and for, for various reasons, but mainly because I, I wasn't rich, you know, and uh, I had only a very small amount of money to be spent on recordings every week. And so I was trying to select carefully. But then holding the CD and putting the CD in the player, uh, starting to listen and starting to reading the liner notes and all the credits. Mm. And like, like you said, uh, I was probably going even a bit beyond that. I was trying to imagine what would have been like, you know, waking up on the 27th of November, 1958, and walk out and taking the metro, you know, with the saxophone at cold, it's, uh, you know, very cold, and going to New Jersey mm. to record, and maybe, you know, you had an issue at home, or uh, your, I don't know, washing machine just broke, you have, you know, you deal with the everyday life, because we tend to idealize everything, but mm. actually, when we try to look beyond, you know, even the biggest you know, mind and the biggest creativity mind, um, creative mind, uh, I don't know, even uh, John Coltrane, he, he mm. had a life, you know, and he was dealing with the everyday life. He mm. had to deal with his agents or maybe he had to pay a parking fine. I don't know. Yeah. And I caught myself a lot, many times, you know, trying to imagine the mood and whether something that happened in during the day or maybe the day before, the night hmm. before, could have impacted uh, the recording and, and how that track, you know, was produced. And the fact that you talk about also the techniques of recording and you try to listen the room, the reverb, the stereoized choices mm. that the engineers, uh, it, it's a big deal. I mean, it, it's something that we can try to understand and analyze to go even deeper into that process. I remember a few years ago when that book, exceptional book called, uh, uh, kind of blue, but Ashley can mm. that probably you have read it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It was so enlightening, you know, to to see and to be there, to be in the recording room mm. with them mm. and listening to their voices, because that that's another level of transcription. Because Ashley can transcribed everything but the music. Yes. Uh, and it's so precious because you, you can be teletransported there and you can understand, you know, what was going on in the sound engineer mind and how they dealt with people like Miles. You know, that probably <laughs> yeah. wasn't easy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and all those details, unfortunately, you know, go away on Spotify or mm. Apple Music. You don't get, but not even 2%. If you are lucky, you get the artist's name and the title, right? Yeah. But if you are unlucky, you don't even know, you know, the name where, of where they're from. Yep. Who composed the track? 
you know, it, it's yeah, kind anything. of important. Well, look, uh, look, this is, uh, don't even get me started on, you know, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the big green, as they call it, the, um, look, it's, um, context is extremely important to me. You know, I'm, uh, I'm all about the details and, you know, um, I, I still I still fundamentally believe that there exists a incredible need for um, uh, for humans to be challenged um, or challenged or provoked into listening to things that they don't normally listen to. And the best avenue for that, um, I think, actually is human curation. I don't think the algorithm can effectively turn you on to new music. I mean, sure, you can you can program the algorithm to make appropriate suggestions that are based on existing listening habits and all of those sorts of things. But you know, in where we're recording here in uh, Melbourne, uh, in Victoria, in Australia, um, we have the benefit of really fantastic community radio stations that play a lot of different jazz based music and it's not just jazz you know there's fiesta jazz and yeah. jazz on saturday and you know there's funkier side of jazz there's latin side of jazz there's all these different interacting orbits that kind of meld into one and the the real genius about the um and what's fantastic about our community radio stations um that have that rely upon you know subscribers supporting them is that the announcers uh, are often worldwide experts in their chosen field and their job is to turn you on to things that you don't know that you love yet. And that is, for me, that is just a phenomenal thing. I mean, the I guess one of the things that um, was really responsible for me building up a more of a mind map of what happened when in jazz and why it was so brilliant um, there was a fantastic uh, radio announcer called Steve Robertson who um, ran the Jazz on Saturday program for many, many years. And he just turned me on to the things that I didn't know that I liked yet because, you know, he provided context and there was interesting stories and he's, he, he, he told us when it, when it was recorded, where it was recorded, who was playing on the album. All these things are important. And I guess it comes back to the, the deeper kind of thing about transcription yeah. is that it is the idea of listening and the layers of listening that you can uh, engage with. Sure, you can just put on some random Spotify playlist and it will be oral wallpaper um, to the background of your day. You don't have to engage. It's, it's uh, inoffensive enough that you can just go about your day and you're not working or doing your thing to silence. It's just something yeah. sort of happening. So that's a very superficial level, okay? But what we're encouraging and what I think makes us, you know, human and much more uh, enriched by this thing that we call music, which is just crazy vibrations in the air. You know, we, we, we're seeking to, to try and find deeper understandings of music. And whenever we try to articulate that in words, it always comes up short because it's always based on feelings and um, things that are very difficult to describe. But still, we are we are still trying to listen deeply and try to understand it on a deeper level. Yeah. Now, whether that is, you know, slowing it down on transcription software and you know, sound slice, I think is an extraordinary tool. And um, might I say, your your transcriptions and um, uh, that you that you post uh, are absolutely fantastic, and it is a it's an extraordinary resource that you that you're developing here. Like it's it's really to be commended because Thank not you. only is it a is it a is service to the community, but it is also an insight into genius. And yeah. I think you know it's an insight into the magic. Yeah. And so you know I, I absolutely applaud and encourage you to keep going with that. <laughs> Thank you. You know. And this leads uh, us to the next question, which is what uh, you, you almost replied uh, already, but what do you expect to bring home when you transcribe? Like, uh, is there anything else apart from what you said about, you know, the room and getting into the genius mind of the player? 
uh, what are your expectations you know when you start a, a, tr a transcription well it, it depends uh, it depends what i'm going in with to try and seek to understand i mean am i going in with a you know you know how to play over this ultra dominant chord in a particular approach by this particular musician i mean is that the the thing that i'm seeking to try and understand or am i trying to seek to understand um the ingredients that have come together to make this particular recording um and so i guess the thing that i'm trying to get out of it uh of transcription um involvement um apart from being closer to the genius and these sorts of things is is to actually just seek to understand it further and to learn more about um how it goes together but also um to be able to listen much more deeply you know and and not just focus on you know, the instrument that i might play but what's happening with the drums and you know how's the bass interacting with that and You know, uh, what is the main lead instrument or the or the vocalist doing over that? How are they? Where is the push and pull happening? Where, you know, how how is this cake actually being developed? How how is it how is it being made? What ingredients have come together? In what order, um, to make this particular sound happen? Yeah. You know, is it is it capturing everyone at once with a single stereo microphone? Um, live in the studio or is it you know um, using the studio as an instrument to construct you know a a thing that can only exist in the studio whereabouts between those two parameters um, does this exist and so uh, I've had the um, I've had the immense um, uh, honor really um, to be to be asked to contribute um, musicological deep dives um, in Uh, the Dingo Jazz Journal. Um, so uh, I think there are four editions in uh, yeah. at the moment. And so I've done a musicological deep dive uh, for each of those editions and looked at, you know, Australian music. And, you know, I've, I've really listened to those things quite intently and sought to understand what's going on with yeah. those. And it's not just an instrument. So for our international audience uh, dingo is a jazz magazine uh, produced and developed here in australia and has reached the fourth um, issue and it's a great magazine you know it's another way to look into the australian jazz scene and it's really good to have it sorry i absolutely I thought i had to <laughs> no no well, well, yeah i think it's good to define that i think um You know, looking at the the transcriptions or the the musicological analysis that I've done of those those sorts of pieces, um, I've learnt things about the pieces, and not only from talking to the composers, but um, but actually trying to seek to understand what is going on, you know, in the music on a deeper level. Yeah, and you know, uh, I, I will tell this story as well because I, I think I think it's a It's also important, um, you know, in in developing a strange as we will call those uh, many, many, many moons ago, um, there is an Australian ensemble called The Nex, N-E-C-K-S. I'm familiar with The Nex. Absolutely. It's a great band. It's a fantastic band. And, you know, I, you could easily describe them as Australia's best jazz export, really. They tour internationally every year. They're hugely successful. They... They play sold out shows everywhere. So for our international guests, um, well worth checking out. Now, I, I guess to summarize them, I don't really want to pigeonhole them, but to give you a bit of an overview of where they're at, they are an improvising trio of uh, piano, double bass and drums. And you, you could say, sure, well, what's so, you know, extraordinary about that? Um, they are... I guess there is, uh, they are trying to attain a pure improvisation in which that they don't talk or discuss about what they're going to play before they play it. So there is, there is deeply uh, present a, um, uh, 
a, a deep listening and a presence on stage of you know uh, listening and responding in real time. And sure, you can you can say that there's lots of repetition involved and it's meditative often, and um, you know that uh, repetitive nature of things uh, can uh, can sort of suggest and bring out different um, you know uh, mental imagery, uh, I guess, and different um, states of being where there is. Uh, if uh, lot if there is lots of repetition and static uh, nature of things that occur over a long period of time with very small aspects changing, you know, um, those very small changes become very significant. Now, that is unlike a whole lot of jazz that you would hear that are going on at the moment. Anyway, the necks are really fantastic. So uh, in putting together the Strange Jazz Real Book, I, uh, I thought it would be really important to represent them. Yeah. But, you know, they're a purely improvising trio. Why or sh even should you um, transcribe their work when there is no intention of even them playing their tunes again? Because they're not tunes to start off with, they're improvisations. Yeah. Um, they wouldn't play anything that they have played the same way twice. And their albums are frequently, you know, 50-ish minutes. It's a, it's a whole set and it's a, it's, a, it's a block of sound. It's not a tune, it's, 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 a, it's a long form improvisation. So, you know, I contacted them and said, you know, is, would you be up for this? Is it appropriate? You know, all of these sorts of things they met and they talked about, they discussed it. Um, and you know they they unanimously agreed that it was a good idea and you know um the the wonderful uh, melbourne piano player jack uh Sarilat was um you know i was talking to him about you know uh transcription and you know uh, putting together a resource like this and he was very generous uh, with his help for which i am eternal, eternally grateful so having a conversation with him and he, and he said I said, oh, look, you know, I'd really like to include this. It's a 52 minute piece. You know, I'm not even sure how to go about doing this uh, or whether it's even appropriate or even if it's possible. And Jex was like, hold my beer. I've got this. <laughs> and, then, and then suddenly, you know, a, a week or so later, um, you know, he comes back to me with this transcription that he did reducing this 52 minute epic extraordinary piece of uh, improvising genius. He reduced it into like a six or eight page lead sheet. And he had, you know, detailed the themes and he detailed all the development and detailed what was happening. And the act of doing that, I thought was really extraordinary because I did not expect to be able to see the architecture um, of the piece um, uh, because I, when when you're listening to it, you can't see what's uh, you can't see the global so much. You can't sort of see the wood from the trees. But when you step back and you use different parts of your brain to to listen and to observe and use, I guess, a bit more left brain analysis of what's going on, you start to see those patterns and themes emerging, and you see the retrograde, you see the inversion, you see the development. And I'm so glad that it exists. And I'm so glad that Jex did that work um, because it is an insight into the improvisational genius of that particular ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that's actually really, that's really exciting. And I guess if you were, if you were interested in improvisation to be able to uh, analyze that later, even though it's not really meant to be analyzed in that way, it is still an insight into the genius. And I'm glad that it exists. Yeah. And generally speaking, uh, how do you choose the solos or the music that you are going to transcribe? Is there a, a Nikolsky method or, <laughs> <laughs> or you simply, you know, bump into something that you like and you want to, bring out the microscope and look from closer 
Uh, well, it's, it's so it's so diverse uh, depending on... Uh, okay, so number one, the things that I would... Um, I would transcribe uh, the things that would be spinning my wheels at the time, you know, you know, I, there needs to be some kind of thing that there's some kind of spark in me that goes, oh, wow, this is really fantastic. I want to get closer to understanding what goes on here. Um, but then I think about, you know, what is the, what is the thing that is really great about this? So is it, you know, no choice? Is it, you know, improvisational ability? What, What's the thing that's actually going on here? Um, and I'm just thinking about some of the things that I've been listening to very, very closely recently. I, it's not necessarily about, you know, about soloing. It's, it's, it's about time and um, how um, instruments are interacting with each other. And it's about sounds and textures and those sorts of things. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more about you know, how drums are, how drums are tuned. I'm thinking about how compressors are working. I'm thinking about mic techniques and placements. I'm thinking about those sorts of things to build up that mind map and those sorts of understandings. Cause I'm, I'm increasingly unable to separate, um, the creative practice from the, uh, the act of documenting, um, through recording. Yeah, and those those things are much more enmeshed in each other now, um, and yeah, I, I I guess you can you can separate the performer from you know the art of recording, but that that artifact and that sound is so intimately you know enmeshed in it, in, in itself that it's hard it's hard to separate. So. Uh, and you know, I, I I I like geeking out about recording gear. It's you know, it's it's that <laughs> it's, it's that same it's that same sort of you know analysis, um, uh, focus on detail, sort of left brain kind of um, thing where you just are really um, about details and about analysis. <clears throat> and Tim, what is your methodology? Uh, you mentioned before that. Um... There are people using different platforms and you mentioned Sound Slides, which is the one I started using recently. Uh, do you use a software? Do you slow it down or you don't need to? So do you have sort of a routine that you put well, in place? Sadly, I, I don't believe that I was gifted with any uh, you know, particular inane you know, uh, gift from a, a higher power to, uh, you know, with perfect pitch or any of these sorts of things. So anything, the, the modest uh, amount of things that I have in my musician's toolkit are, um, uh, are hard fought, uh, shall we say. So, um, you know, normally I pick up an instrument and, you know, try and play along with YouTube. And I know that sounds like a very basic <coughs> thing, but to be able to slow things down, you know, on, on YouTube and rewind and use those shortcuts and all those sorts of things, I think is actually really fantastic. And it's also, you know, as a feedback mechanism, there is, uh, there is that great thing that you get when your, your ear is preparing for the thing that you are about to hear and that relationship between your uh, oral development and your theoretical understanding of music how it generally goes together as well as being able to translate that in an instantaneous way on your instrument when those when all those things kind of collide that that feels really great as a feedback mechanism so playing along with things that are you know unfamiliar or that you haven't heard before it is yeah. impossible to turn those things off in your brain. You know, this is the thing about transcription and being a musician as well. It is, it is near impossible to listen with a lay person's ears. And I know Bill Evans talks about this in the um, uh, in that extraordinary black and white um, uh, documentary um, that that he did. Um, but it's. To listen with those lay person's ears, I think is uh, if you can forget about everything that you know musically and just listen to the genius, that is that can really transport you. But 
you know what it's like. You had a gig or something, you listen to something. I can't help my analysis brain. I can't easily switch that off and go, oh, well, you know, that's a that's a one five six four, or and you know they go to the 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 third dominant seven in the in the bridge, and oh, there's that accent on you know the R of two, and you know like I then that's being side chained to that, and wow, don't that's that keyboard patch from from that particular thing, and then that references all these. It, this is just like this this sea of things that are floating around my ears and my brain whilst the music is happening. Yeah, and so. <clears throat> Yeah, no, you're right. <clears throat> and sometimes I feel a bit jealous about, uh, you know, those persons that don't have any knowledge of music and mm. they are true listeners because they are like a blank page and yes. they don't have any bias in their minds. And so to me, it's like when I go to see a, a picture exhibition like I went recently to the Picasso mm. exhibition at the National Gallery and I was thinking you know if you are a painter and you you have made painting all your life you know you you sit in front of a painting and your mind immediately start to see the technique mm. You know, the composition, all, all the theory, all those things, yeah, yeah. behind yeah. it, and yeah. in a in a certain way, it damage mm. the fruition of the work of art. You know, and sometimes I feel a little bit bad about it. I I would like to be when I would when I go to the movies. You know, I I know nothing about you know a camera or the theory behind filming. Uh, so I just watch the movie and then I can feel the feelings, emotions without any theoretical, you know, layer of reasoning. But mm. when I listen to music, I feel a bit disadvantaged. And so in a way, transcribing, it goes in the opposite direction, but there is a point where... And it happens several times where you have an eureka moment and when mm. you understand, wow. And that wow compensates with the fact that I'm not a white you know, piece of paper. Mm. And so those people that can enjoy music as is, they will never get that eureka moment given by the fact that you just discover, you dig, you know, and there is a diamond there mm. that you only got it because you went, you know, deep enough. This, this is an interesting thing. And I'm, I'm glad that you, that you raised it, actually, because it, it, um, I'm not sure how cliche this is, but it, it's, it seems that... Uh, the act of uh, and the pursuit of becoming a better musician is just sort of uh, mired in struggle. And it, you know, it, it, you know, if it was if it was easy, then everyone would do it. And so we involve ourselves in the hard things by trying to force ourselves or force our ear into hearing things that we don't yet understand so that we can integrate it into our playing and you know seek to understand it and seek to hear it in the future but that that act of struggle i think is is a really interesting idea that um involving yourself in the difficult things and in the challenging things there is there is a reward that is unique you know as as part of that but i I, I can't help but think, but you know, coming back to what you were saying before as well, that um, you know about being it, hard to be satisfied, you know, with music because we we have this you know critical and, and analysis kind yeah. of thing going on. Um, it, the there is there's a whole lot of value systems that are involved with particular genres of music, whether it be jazz, whether it be you know, indie, whether it be punk, whether it be, you know, whatever kind of aspect of music that you're involving yourself in, those those values need to be need to be challenged. They need to be 
uh, they need to be questioned. And so uh, um, I think about my own listening and my own involvement in, in, in music of different genres. And I listen to those things and in, interact with those things um, because I get different satisfactions from them. And so uh, I will purposefully listen to things that are specifically quite removed from jazz because that allows more of a clean slate without any particular, um, you know, uh, prejudice or expectation or, you know, uh, things that are difficult to satisfy. So, um, yeah, we, I think we all need to reset our values a little bit so that we are possibly less critical and more, easily able to see the positive things in different musics because I, I think there's there's good things to focus on in every single um, style of music and in every single uh, thing that is going on including you know uh, the current state of popular music you know uh, you know listening to that with with jazz ears is confronting um, However, there are still interesting things to that go on that uh, I'm still seeking to try to understand because there is something worthwhile in everything. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. Uh, thanks <clears throat> for that. And do you usually write it down, the transcription, or not? Um, you know, not not so much. I will I will try and learn those things. Like if it's a particular solo that I'm that I'm working on, I will try and integrate that so that it is I'm forming those really strong bonds between my ear, my brain, uh, and my hands. So, and then so that when I listen back to those things, um, I have that I have that oral visualization of uh you know visualizing my fingers and my hands interacting with an instrument whilst that solo is going on so that when i'm listening to it i can i can see and feel what it is like to play those notes and and i can feel those feelings to a much deeper extent when uh when i'm able to do that so so I guess that that the act of transcribing, you know, uh, in that respect, in that particular situation, is is a pathway to um, uh, feeling the feels more. I guess. Yeah. It's it's <clears throat> it's building those bridge between the physical and the emotional and and also the intellectual. That's good. I'm, of course, uh, for the podcast, but also for some other. <clears throat> Uh, educational purposes or just for the pleasure of it I <clears throat> try to write it down but after I learn it well if I have the time mm. if I don't have the time and I want to release another episode of the podcast I just do the transcription and <clears throat> recently I started doing some live streaming where I transcribe in real time so I thought some people might be interested in seeing uh, how I do it and then it's just my my methodology but uh, I just released uh, I think yesterday morning an episode of uh, yesterday morning we are in, in December recording this but this episode will be you know, release probably next year. So it's so wrong to say yesterday morning. <laughs> but in December, I released this uh, uh, episode of the podcast where I analyze uh, Chris Potter's solo on mm. All the Things You Are. And I wrote it down on Sound Slides. And I use all the colors, different colors to color different parts and to try to make it visible for the people to understand a little bit what I think is Chris Potter thinking. Then, mm. of course, we can't be 100% sure, but there are some moments where you can tell that that idea is generated by the fact that, you know, a couple of seconds before that thing happened, maybe in the piano or 
maybe in, in his own play. And this, you know, goes back to when I was at the conservatorium in Italy. I was uh, taking a course of analysis and the teacher was all into the Schenker uh, method. Mm. So I just sometimes use the same uh, methodology. So try to find the actual seed that generated the next you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds of music. And it's it's almost a uh, fun game to do because sometimes you can go back, I don't know, 24 bars, you know, and you are still on the same idea. Uh, but the difficulty that I encounter when I write, and I have talked about this, is the compromise that you need to put in place. You know, every time you write music, even your own compositions, you are actually already compromising a lot. Mm. You know, because what is in our mind, it's hard to notate sometimes, unless it's, I'm thinking of a major scale in crotchets. That's, mm. that's easy. But even there, you know, if I play with a metronome, and I just want to play a scaling crotchets, laying back a little bit. How do you write it then? So yeah. you have to put in place a, a compromise, a, a sort of strategy to minimize the gap between what you have in mind and the actual mm. result. So when I was a student, I used to do this uh, checking with mm. my friends. I was writing a transcription and then give it straight to one friend and, and ask the friend to play it, sight reading. And if the result was close enough, I thought I did a good job. Mm. But sometimes the phrase was, no, no, hang on, this phrase is completely different. And the guy said, well, this is what you wrote. And yeah. So I had to reconsider and maybe what sounds like a triplet is better if you write it in a different way to make it. So I I found even that process very interesting, but uh, there is a lot of limitations in it. And you feel that the music, especially improvised music, goes literally miles beyond uh, the sterile, you know, written paper because... oh look absolutely yeah traditional western european you know uh, notation systems you know it, it is a massive compromise it is really you know uh it is a poor imitation to document what is actually going on however it is it is a tool and i completely agree it is uh it, it is a compromise uh, and far yeah. from accurate but but very often you know to write it down and to spend five minutes thinking, is this a quintuplet, a sixtuplet, or is four semiquavers and a semi-demiquaver at the end? You know, all those questions makes you understanding a bit more mm. the magic of it. And then eventually you get a couple of those moments where you understand deeply that sometimes you know, especially jazz music goes, as I said, beyond something that you can write it down. It's mm. it's, it's it's a feeling, yeah, mm. and, and it's a stream of consciousness mm. that is nothing to do with you know written music or reading music. And I, I used to say, you know, my students know all my uh, rules. Uh, if we accept the saying. I read music. I want to be allowed to say I play the newspaper. Hmm. Right? Because when you say I read music, you you actually say I can decodify the theory of music. Hmm. Hmm. But you are not making music. You are not playing. You are reading music. See this. This is interesting because it, it's it's different layers of the onion, isn't it? Like this is different yeah. layers of listening. This is different layers of, you know, integrating, um, 
you know, we, we've we've talked earlier, you know, uh, about this where you know the um, the act of transcription is getting closer to the genius and yeah. trying to seek to understand what is actually going on in the music, so we can hopefully, you know, integrate that in our own performance and compositional practice. Um, but I th I think that that act of you know um, really analyzing something and seeking to understand it in a in a quantifiable way, you know, in the act of making music and being in that flow state and being, you know, you, you're jamming with your band and you were creating music in real time. Hopefully you are not thinking about all those conscious things. Hopefully you are in that moment and allowing your subconscious to come through. And hopefully those things that you have analyzed and integrated your in your toolkit, I, I guess that, you know, studying the masters like Chris Potter and those sorts of people, it is almost that you are giving yourself permission to, to go for particular things in particular circumstances so that you have that understanding when you, when the heat is on and you are in that moment, when you are in that moment, then you can do that and you can rip that out and you yeah. have that permission to do that thing so i guess there's different layers of understanding and knowledge and all those sorts of things but hopefully that uh conscious understanding can turn into sort of unconscious doing you know yeah. and not thinking about what you're doing as you're doing it that it just comes out absolutely because it, it'll 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 come out like you anyway whether you whether you st whether the, whether you study you know Chris Potter or or Coltrane or whoever, it still comes out like you, right? Yeah, th that's very interesting that you pulled it out. And I have another doubt that I I would like to to tell you. It's, it's a little story. <clears throat> so I'm studying at uh, Siena Jazz, which which is a big jazz school in Italy, in Siena, in Tuscany. And uh, one day I have a final, sort of final concert with uh, a band of students led by a great pianist. His name is Stefano Battaglia. And the concert was on the 17th of July. And so we, we celebrated <clears throat> Coltrane because it was his uh, date of death. And uh, so we thought of celebrating Col Coltrane and it was a large ensemble with like four saxophones, three drums, three double bass and wow. a, a piano. Uh, yeah, very, very large ensemble. And at the end of the concert, uh, one of the most well-known and respected jazz critic <coughs> came to the backstage and told me uh, he gave me some really really nice compliments and he said we can hear that you have you know dived deep into Coltrane's mind into Coltrane's idea because we we, we can hear that you have processed you know his ideas and, and they are coming out and I didn't know what to say because at that stage, I think I only listened to a couple of albums of Coltrane. I was listening to different people, completely different. I was more into uh, modern speaking, like people like Joe Lovano mm. or older guys like Ben Webster or Colin mm. Hawkins or Stan Getz. Yeah. Uh, so I was... You know, I was young, but also I'm prepared that, but to receive that comment, which was so distant from the reality in my mind. Mm. But then I started thinking and reflecting that what people hear mm. is not what you think okay. <laughs> that yeah. they should hear. You can't yeah. control that. You can't control that. And, and also everyone listens to everything differently and with maybe, their own values. And maybe even those two or three albums of Coltrane that I used to listen back then 
found a way you know to come out into mm. my plane mm. or maybe this guy was just drunk that day we we don't know but anyway mm. it's interesting that sometimes what you expect and what you feel is completely different from you know what the people so there is another filter mm. there, there's a, there is another compromise so uh, it's a complex matter but it, it's very fascinating and well, look it's it's super interesting I, I guess you know we all stand on the shoulders of giants and those who have come before and you know everything comes from somewhere you know creativity does not exist in a vacuum like yeah we we are we are influenced to a certain extent by the people that have path uh, forged the path before us it's impossible to get away from but yes um you know uh i think in a in a australian context or a european context or even perhaps more of a non-us context you know, there it can't help but come out from with our own voice, with our own influence. Um, you know, yes, and that's what I love about Australian jazz scene is its identity, mm. which is not dependent on the American tradition. Mm. Which I thought, you know, when I came here the first time, I thought, oh, maybe Australia, you know, it's a Commonwealth country but mm. maybe they are a victim you know of uh, <laughs> sort of american jazz dependency which sometimes can happen in europe but i think especially in the last 30 years we got out of it but as soon as i moved here and i started you know diving into the, the scene i could understand that you are very independent here and you have your own voice and mm. all the, you know, the 30,000 plus years of history are, you know, conveying into any creative process of an Australian artist. So that that's mm. so fascinating. It's an interesting thing for sure. Yeah. All right. We are heading uh, towards the end. I, I could spend hours and hours talking oh uh, look team. absolutely yeah we could we could spend at least the rest of the day talking yeah. uh, about stuff so yeah so, it's always great to have a conversation um sorry i did something stupid uh so is it uh who was the most difficult player you transcribed uh look um you know being, I guess guitar is, is, is my main sort of instrument that I, that I have, you know, uh, studied more formally for the most amount of years, even though, you know, I play lots of bass and lots of double bass gigs. Um, is like the Coltrane thing, you know, the, the, the jazz guitar equivalent for me is where's Montgomery. And yeah. so, you know, um, it is, it's it's an interest it's an interesting exercise to to transcribe um wes because whilst wes was not a, a like a formally schooled musician um he, there was there was an attitude and a feeling and um a swagger and uh um a way that he approached his instrument that he could make the wrong notes sound right yeah. and 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 it was it's fascinating to get a, an insight into that but i mean apart from the, the the technical difficulties of actually being able to do that kind of thing it, it's it's a true insight into that um and of course you know i can also say you know the um uh you know pat Metheny and you know that album that he did with charlie hayden uh beyond the missouri sky yeah. is 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 one of my favorites and you know uh, transcribing things on that it yeah. has been a real ear opening exercise yeah but you, you know um just on that i th i think I, I had to really reflect on that album and, and think well you know i used to i used to think oh well you know this album is so amazing because pat is playing this beautiful round tone and it, it's it's you know, it's that atmosphere on that recording and, and it has all that imagery and, and, you know, 
it's you know it's pat it's, it's pat this it's pat that and you know all that but i started to think listen more more deeply to it and i started to um you know check out other collaborations that um, charlie hayden had done in small group settings often as a duo with with other people there's a whole great sort of series of these yeah. and i realized that the actual um the genius behind that album is not as much pat as i initially thought it's it's actually charlie hayden's um uh i don't want to say quietness but um he he's his understated genius and what he brings to the room. Um, he manages to extract a, a certain way of playing out of the people that he collaborates with. Now, from a transcription kind of perspective, I think that is extraordinary because what is it that he actually brings into the studio that makes those people play that certain way? How does, how does he do that? And how do you document that? How do you reproduce that so that you get those sounds? There you go. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think I remember there is written in the liner notes again, you know, those things that young people don't do anymore. I think there is a line where Pat Mihini says, I love playing with Charlie Hayden because he's one of the few bass players who loves to play the tonics yeah <laughs> and if you listen to that album he plays the tonics but he plays in a way that is so beautiful so settled mm. so inspirational and complete and, yeah and Just, he only needs to play one note and, and it's everything you, a world is contained in that one note as well know? as so difficult to do so because mm. you know it's in some ways it's always easier to fill one bar with thousand notes you, mm. know, you just shred your instrument up and down and people <laughs> go wow but mm. then you play one note and you make people feel <coughs> overwhelmed with one mm. note mm. i think that's wins right yeah absolutely yeah and and you know, uh, uh, Charlie Hayden came out and he did a workshop. I remember it distinctly at uh, in Federation Square at uh, the performance space there. Yeah. And and I just I just really remember it was like it was like witnessing uh, you know, the the word from the top of the mountain. Yeah. It was so profound that he didn't need to say a whole lot of things because. The music spoke for itself, but it was like a world within each of those root notes, you know, and you could hear the fingers on the string. Yeah. You could hear the fingers on the instrument. Um, and so, yeah. It's yeah, Pat, Pat is saying, as everyone knows by now, he's simply one of the greatest improvising musicians ever, and his bass playing has set the standard for what is now several generations of musicians. With Charlie, I feel like I can play anything. Ah, uh, you know, and freedom. <laughs> and yeah, you, you think you know, it's just playing one note, and you have Pat Metheny saying, "Oh, I can do everything." You know, with you, yeah. it means that in that one note, there is so much inside mm. that you don't need anything else. And actually, it's funny that you said that because one of my, uh, when I started the, the podcast, I started transcribing, you know, more regularly. And one of the most difficult ones was I did a Charlie Hayden transcription of his solo on The Cost of Living on Michael mm. Brecker's album. Right. Because that album was, you know, I, I was, I don't know, 16, 17, and I bumped into that album and I fell in love with that ballad, Cost of Living, written by Don Gromick. And the solo that Charlie plays before Breaker it haunted me for years. And like last year, I transcribed it. And I had to call a couple of bass player friends, <laughs> you know, to check it out because it was difficult. Mm. He's not doing, 
you know, difficult or virtuosistic stuff. It's not mm. like John Patitucci. Yeah. But sometimes the rhythm, sometimes he plays two two notes at once and, you know, I don't play bass. So for me, going to try to catch, you know, and to, again, compromise, to minimize the compromise, mm. to write it down was super challenging. Yeah. It's funny that you say that. And Tim, the last question is the silliest question ever, uh, but I I force you to <laughs> respond sure. to this. If you are sent on a desert island and you can mm. only take one solo that eventually will save your life, what that would be? Uh, you know, this is actually a really fantastic question. Um, you don't have to say that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think it. I think it is. Um, uh, and I'm going to answer it this way. Um, the the solo that I would like to take with me to the desert island is the solo I have that I am yet to hear. Oh, that that's cheating. <laughs> no, 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 because. And no, it, it, I think it goes much more towards. It, it goes much more toward towards my my appetite to hear new things. Yeah. So so yeah. Look, I can I can totally quote Oscar Peterson solos where he's just ripping it in that in that trio with Ray Brown and like like that's that's amazing. Yeah. Or Stan Getz solo would be up the top of the list as well because he just, you know. And and even you know um, there's some small group Paul Desmond stuff where he's just there is just a freedom that it that exists in his in his playing which yeah. is just dances kind of effortlessly all of those things but they already exist right the thing that I'm looking forward to hearing the most is the thing that I have not yet heard because yeah. I'm I'm hungry for the next thing so all right uh, no that's good that's good. <laughs> It's just a little, you know, to to end with a little fun. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Tim, this is it. I have been really, really honored to talk to you today. It's it's and, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank uh, you for all your work as well. It's just absolutely amazing what you're doing. Thanks. So, uh, as usual, all the links to Tim's websites and and out. Um, external links so-called will be in the video description and the podcast description check the Australian Jazz Real book out it's a great project and it's still growing every day so a lot of resources there even to discover you know new artists so it's a very uh, healthy practice to do and has been a pleasure thanks again for your generosity and see you you. next time look forward to it thanks very much for today really appreciate it thank you bye bye everyone